It looks beautiful from the outside, but when you peel off the mask and talk to the victims, you uncover another part of the story. The documented evidence you are about to see may seem unbelievable, but it's all true. When they took my family, there wasn't anything else to live for. I tried to kill myself. Thank God I didn't succeed. I think the most difficult part of this for me is that they have turned my own beautiful children against me. You know, the brainwashing techniques of this organization are really incredibly effective. On behalf of a growing number of victims, Ed Decker, together with Dick Baer, themselves victims of this powerful organization, consulted with a Los Angeles-based law firm about filing a class action lawsuit. Mr. Baer, Mr. Decker, just what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a massive organization, a multi-billion dollar corporation whose wealth is, is, is worldwide and whose influence is staggering. I've got records of, of many, many homes that have been shattered by these people. I consider it to be one of the most deceptive and most dangerous groups in the entire world. I have documentation that ties it into the occult, into Satanism. Mr. Decker, I, d I don't doubt your sincerity, but I find this very hard to believe. I mean, these people pride themselves in a sense of family togetherness and a very conspicuous form of uh, moral rectitude. That's part of the incredible deception, and that's what we have to dig into, and we need, to, we need to expose it. We need to open it up to the truth. Salt Lake City, Utah, Mecca of Mormonism. One of the wealthiest and fastest growing religions with over five million members worldwide. To the outside world, the Mormon church presents a carefully groomed Osman family image. With an emphasis on family togetherness, an inspiring history and high moral standards, the Mormon church, also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or LDS, turns out tens of thousands of missionaries a year whose goals are to spread Mormonism around the world. Most of them are trained here at Brigham Young University, also known as BYU. To most of us, Mormons appear to be real Christians who live their faith. Dr. Harold Goodman, BYU professor, former Mormon bishop, currently an LDS mission president. Well, the church encourages the family to be as self-sustaining as possible in their activities, starting with the family home evening, where the father, who is the patriarch of the family, would gather his family together. There they would have a prayer, an opening song or two. Uh, I looked out the window and what did I see? Popcorn popping on the apricot tree. We are very much a family-centered church because we believe that strong families make for a strong nation, and strong nations make for a strong world. The Mormon church has had a phenomenal growth. In the next 50 years, it will be approximated about 70 million people to 100 million people. There are many reasons why this is so. One is the vast uh, missionary program we have over the world. Approximately right now, 28,000 missionaries and 186 missions. Thousands of early church members were recruited from Britain and brought over to supplement the church in America during the 1830s. Mr. Brian Grant is the director of public relations for the Mormon Church in Great Britain and Ireland, where membership has increased a thousand percent in the last 20 years. I suppose everybody's idea of a Mormon missionary are those two dark young men who sort of ride around the town on bikes and knock on your door at uh, inopportune times. In actual fact, we have an increasing number of young women serving in the missionary field and also quite a lot of um, retired couples free of family responsibilities who feel that they too want to share the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So many people have joined the church, I believe, because of the... Uh, gospel principles that it gives uh, understanding and enlightenment of who they are, uh, who they were, and what they may become. Jim and I came 
from very strong Christian families. We were introduced to Mormonism through a business partner of Jim's. I had always had this preconceived idea that a Mormon was somebody who went around dressed in black and had 16 wives, which was not true, of course. These people seemed to be Christian. Any people that I had ever been around that were Christian, they had these, the same attributes. Just kind, good, loving people, family-oriented. All the things they did revolved around their religion. People of the Mormon church, they were all so friendly. And they took me in by dances and all the different kids at school. They were all pushing me on, saying, I'm so glad you're going to join the Mormon church. They got me into the church through their social program, which is fabulous and the family atmosphere, which was mine was broken up, therefore I went right to it. The youth are certainly uh, are the strength of the church in the future. Consequently, uh, we hold classes for the youth in, on Sunday. We have uh, athletic events for our youth. We have socials uh, where they would have fun games, uh, dances. Many of the social events, as well as regular church services, are held in the chapels, which are being built at a rate of two per day around the world. However, the few dozen Mormon temples serve a completely different purpose. No church services are held here, only secret ceremonies, which are reserved for an elite few. The goal of every Latter-day Saint is to be married as a family unit in the house of the Lord and there receive these sacred blessings that will allow us to eventually, if we're worthy, to dwell and be in the presence of our Heavenly Father. You know, not all members of the church uh, go to the temple. That may be something that uh, would surprise you, but to gain admittance to the temple, one has to have what's called a temple recommend. He has to receive a satisfactory interview from his bishop and from his stake president. There he's asked, or she has asked, certain rather penetrating questions about their worthiness, their morality. If he's a full tithe peer, that is the only way that we can be with our Heavenly Father. Otherwise, uh, we could not be in his presence. By going through the temple and by adhering to various regulations, such as abstaining from tea or coffee, paying a substantial portion of your income to the Mormon church, and giving free labor to various church-run organizations, the worthy Mormon can become a god himself in the life hereafter, ruling over his own planet with a number of goddess wives. So you can see why the temple is so important to the Latter-day Saint, because if he is worthy to go into the temple and there receive the sacred ordinances and covenants and keep them, he can eventually grow into becoming a god himself. Before this newly completed temple in Seattle was closed to all but a select group of Mormons, visitors were given the opportunity to get a glimpse inside. For many of these Mormons who came from thousands of miles away and stood for hours in the rain, this may be the only time they will ever be allowed to enter a Mormon temple. Tell me who God the Father is to you. <laughs> he is like you and I, every human being on the face of the earth. So oh, is he a man? Yes, he is. How did he get to be God? He, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's perfect in every way. So if we are perfect, can we become like God? Yes, ma'am. You know, the, the Mormon gods and goddesses, as Joseph Smith taught, were once upon a time just mere humans, just like us. And they worked their way up to becoming gods. There's supposed to be billions of these highly evolved humanoids somewhere out in space overseeing their own planet. This sounds like science fiction or Greek mythology. Would you say that the average Mormon believes these things? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Floyd C. McAlvin, author of the bestseller, The Mormon Illusion. They believe that God eternally progressed, that once he was a man and then he became God. From that comes their doctrine that all can progress, progress to be gods. For instance, uh, in Articles of Faith, they have this by Talmadge, that as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. So their whole doctrine flows from this about becoming gods. Gods and goddesses just won't fly in the jury room. Gentlemen, uh, juries uh, feel a responsibility 
to be skeptical. You need to feed them information that, that has a taste of truth to it. And what you're telling us, I really don't think they're going to swallow it, do you? I did for 19 years. Again, you have to understand the peculiar belief evolving around the Mormon temple marriage. They believe that their godhood is tied to, to eternal exaltation through the marriage and through the family unit. The Mormon church teaches that in order for me to become a goddess, I needed to marry a Mormon man in good standings with the church. And without a husband that could take me through the temple, I wouldn't be able to go to heaven and be with my heavenly father. According to Mormon theology, husbands and wives who have successfully achieved godhood will be required to populate their own planet by procreating as many spirit children as possible. Ever since I was a little girl, I was taught that my primary purpose was to become a goddess in heaven so that I could multiply an earth. And I wanted that. I wanted to be eternally pregnant and look down on an earth and say, that's mine. And I populated that whole earth and all those little babies I had. And to tell you the truth, I find it extremely difficult to believe that the Mormon attorneys and judges I know actually expect to become uh, infinite gods, peopling new worlds and, and engaging in celestial sex with their goddess wives. Why don't you ask them? Uh, well, I would be uh, embarrassed, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, if it's true, as you've suggested, that these uh, people do plan to reproduce themselves across the universe, well, I'd rather not know about it. Uh, we do business with these gentlemen. That's why it's such a secret. That's why even the Mormons don't talk about it. They're embarrassed by it, too. Look, Mormonism is based upon the belief that extraterrestrial humanoids from a star in a distant place called Kolob visited this Earth, came down to this Earth and visited a young boy, 14-year-old boy by the name of Joseph Smith. We had a little animation done to show the difference between Mormonism and Christianity because Mormonism is so far removed from Orthodox Christianity. I'd like to show it to you for a moment, if you don't mind. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here, the god of Mormonism and his wives, through endless celestial sex, produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there. Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remain neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. 
the spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the star base Kolob, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. Mormon apostle Orson Pratt taught that after Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians, who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 AD, the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. 1,400 years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing sacred temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. The Mormons thank God for Joseph Smith, who claimed that he had done more for us than any other man, including Jesus Christ. The Mormons believe that he died as a martyr, shed his blood for us, so that we too may become gods. Space gods from Kolob. Sounds like von Deineken or Battlestar Galactica. Well, we know it's bizarre. I, I know as a finite being, I can never become an infinite God. It's a logical absurdity. That's when I stopped believing it, but I couldn't get my wife to even talk about it. She had to divorce me and find a, another man that was working his way to godhood, or she could not become a God. Are you saying that the Mormon church pressures individuals into divorcing their spouses when they're not measuring up to the church's standards and also pressures them into marrying another spouse who is working for this godhood? There's no doubt my motivation in all of this stems partly from my own personal experiences. I look back on my own life seeing a bishop counsel me to divorce my wife, uh, seeing my five children whom I raised in the Mormon church pulled from me, and spending all these years just trying to reestablish those relationships. I know literally hundreds of families whose stories 
like this could, could break your heart. Greg and Jolene, divorced because of the Mormon church and have now remarried. He was raised Christian and I was raised Mormon. We just had a very beautiful relationship, but it always came back to the Mormonism. I had to convert him in some way. And after two and a half years of really trying hard, I just couldn't do it, and I was advised to divorce him. Well, it became obvious to the church leaders that my husband was not going to go along with the church standards of the word of wisdom and had no desire to be active in the priesthood. And so they thought that it was perfectly fine and accessible and encouraged me to divorce my husband. The second visit to the counselor, he went over our, the things that we had told him, and he said, well, there are just some people that shouldn't be married. I couldn't imagine a bishop uh, actively counseling for divorce. His job is to seek for ways in which the, the marriage partners can be reconciled. And yet in my case, my wife was advised by the bishop it would be best to, to, for her to divorce me. There will be situations where, for reasons of incom incompatibility of one form or another, uh, a divorce will become inevitable. But uh, because we have such a firm belief in the, in the family unit and the, the sanctity of family life, it's, uh, it would really would be the end of the road and not something that was ever entered into in terms of, uh, of a convenience. I went to my bishop and he advised me that it would be better for me to live without him and to be a servant in Mormon heaven than to stay married to him. And here is a church that teaches family unity and they destroyed my marriage. Gentlemen, this isn't helping your case. Uh, these people have the religious freedom to believe anything they want to. But why should they have the freedom to break up families and destroy lives? The pressure on the Mormon women is incredible. They must be perfect. They swear a, an oath of a total obedience to the, to the husband in the Mormon temple. There's a whole area of psychiatric care dealing with the depression in the Mormon woman. I have a friend who is a nurse in the psychiatric ward and she came to me and asked why is it that there's so many Mormon women in my wing? What's, what's the trouble? And I believe that it's simply because it is an impossibility to live up to the standards that are put upon these Mormon women. They must be perfect so that they can go to exaltation with their husbands. They don't even get out of the grave unless the husband calls them forth on the morning of the first resurrection. And if you do make it to celestial exaltation, heaven to the Mormon woman is being pregnant for all eternity, uh, one spirit baby after the next. There came a point in my life as a Mormon woman that things were not going right at all. My whole time was spent in doing what the Mormon leaders had told me to do. In fact, I came to the point where I felt like life just wasn't worth living anymore. Sandra Tanner, ex-Mormon, author, researcher, considered to be one of the greatest living authorities on Mormonism. Utah has a higher than the national average rate of divorce. It has higher than the national average rate of suicide, especially teen suicide is much higher in Utah than it is nationally. This is partly due to the fact that Mormons emphasize perfection. And so many of these young people feel defeated in their striving for godhood. They can't measure up to everything the church is asking of them. And it just so demolishes their self-esteem that they can't go on, and so then they take their life. I always felt like I wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing good enough uh, in the eyes of God. I couldn't ask for a better brother than Kip. Gene and Perry Eliason father and brother of young Kip, who committed suicide early in 1982 at the age of 16. Kip was almost the perfect son. He was a four-point student, Capitol High School. He was involved with the track team where he got the most inspirational track team member. Kip was my best friend and partner since his mother passed away when he was five years old. The last two years, Kip was so busy with his other activities with the church that most of our outside activities came to a halt. The more deeply Kip got involved with the church, uh, the more depressed he became. So I sat down with Kip and would discuss this problem with him and uh, to find out what was bothering him. At that point, he told me that uh, he had fittings, uh, sexual fittings that were in direct conflict with the teachings of the church. When Kip went to the LDS counselors, they only reinforced the teachings of the church 
which just increased Kip's feelings of unworthiness. I know what Kip was going through. I went to the same type interviews that he did. The pressure was great to strive for worthiness to be perfect all the time. The only problem is Kip took it a little too seriously. The Mormon Church, with its beautiful ads in the Reader's Digest, would like us to believe that it's Christian through and through. Yet, what the outsider sees is not what the insider sees. In, in the Mormon Church, the, uh, the Book of Mormon itself calls the Christian body the Whore of Babylon. The temple ceremony mocks the Christian pastor, calls him a hireling of Satan. Once I got into the church, I was asking questions, and it wasn't the same. It wasn't Christian, as they had told my mom and myself. It just wasn't right. Anyone that believes in Christ is a Christian, and we believe that we are Christians uh, above all other denominations because we have so much revealed information about our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Mormons are instructed to use Christian terminology when talking to potential converts. Words such as God, Jesus, and salvation all have different Mormon meanings, which the outsider may not be aware of. Uh, do you consider Mormonism Christianity? Yes, I do. We believe in God the Eternal Father and in the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. There are so many that have part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We think the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has all of the gospel in its total fullness. Joseph Smith's first vision is the cornerstone of the Mormon church, and yet there are nine versions, each of which contradicts the other. Mormon leaders are deliberately keeping from you the true history of their religion, because they know you will have a hard time believing it's from God if you saw how it really was all put together. In the unpublished accounts, we find that Joseph Smith first said it was just Jesus that appeared to him. The second time he wrote a story down, a few years later, he says many angels appeared to him. Then some years later, he says that two beings appeared. He changes the date, he changes how old he is, he changes the motivation, why he went into the woods to pray, he changes who was there, and he changes what the message was that they gave him. So if he were uh, giving us an actual account of a real experience, we would assume he would have known the first time around whether it was God or Jesus, if it was both of them, what their message was and when it happened. Yet we find him redrafting this story. Well, if you were a witness of an accident and someone asked you to tell about it, if you gave three accounts as divergent as those three are, people would say you couldn't have witnessed the event. The Mormon church keeps changing its scriptures. The, the changes are incredible. There's so many thousands of them. Recently, they canonized the 137th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. When I read this for the first time, I recognized that they omitted over 200 words of the actual revelation as written by Joseph Smith. Why did the church omit the 200 words? Because they contain three blatantly false revelations, prophecies of Joseph Smith. You know, Joseph Smith said the moon was inhabited with people dressed like Quakers and living to be a, a, about a thousand years of age. And Brigham Young seconded it when he said that the moon not only was inhabited, but the sun was inhabited. I believe some of the strongest anti-Mormon literature, if you want to call it that, is the actual publications of the Mormon church. If I believe that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were prophets of the living God, I would have to be a polygamist. The true doctrine teaches that there is no eternal life without a polygamous relationship. Thelma Gear, author, lecturer, outspoken ex-Mormon, and great-granddaughter of convicted Mormon assassin John D. Lee. Sitting here by this fireplace, I'm reminded of my great-grandfather John D. Lee, who was a Mormon pioneer, a bodyguard for Joseph Smith and Brigham Young as they visited secretly their numerous polygamous wives. I'm reminded that my great-grandfather had 19 wives and 64 children. Emma Smith, Joseph's wife, uh, is admonished in this same Doctrine and Covenants to uh, be obedient to the call and to accept these other wives of Joseph Smith or receive the, uh, the penalty thereof. This uh, diary tells how Joseph was sneaking around behind Emma's back to practice polygamy. 
how he had to promise Emma he would give up all his plural wives just for her, and yet he tells his friend that I had to tell Emma that, but I didn't really mean it. Today in Utah, there are approximately 25,000 polygamous marriages. These people are the fundamentalists who believe that Brigham Young was a prophet of God and, and that this section of the DNC is true and that they cannot take away this eternal covenant with God by some law of the land. The Mormon church has deliberately hidden the records of its early church leaders, of their early documents, their early publications from their members. Ron Prittis, business manager of the 7th East Press, a newspaper published by young Mormons seeking reform in the church through exposing Mormon cover-ups. Some of the items uh, that have brought the most uh, attention to the paper are uh, items of church history, theology, and some of the dishonesty on the part of some of the administrators in dealing with students. And there are so many things in the church records, if they were open for public inspection, it would tarnish this beautiful image that the church puts out. The missionary comes to your door. We have a beautiful story to tell you about families, and they want to tell you what a glorious place this is to raise your children. Uh, the missionary isn't part of the cover-up. He doesn't know this. He has been told that everything will check out. It's all 100% true. He thinks the records are open. He doesn't even realize he couldn't go to Salt Lake and see these documents for himself. We're in the Christian uh, faith. We, we find our scholars looking for earlier manuscripts, always refining, always going back to the, to the earliest manuscripts to improve and, and, and validate the authenticity of the Holy Scripture. In Mormonism, it's completely the opposite. The leaders have to go back and rework, rewrite, cover up, change, delete, add, all the way through on uh, all of their books, their history, their scriptures. Uh, they suppress their diaries because these things show the uh, confusion and the um, man-made nature of the theology and the religion. The Book of Mormon claims to be an actual historical record translated from real plates that Joseph Smith unearthed in a hill in New York. Now, if this is a genuine history, one would assume you could study this just like you would study any historical book. History. Dr. Charles Crane, author, college professor, expert on Mormon archaeology. As we look at the Book of Mormon, we find an entirely different story. Instead of being an actual record of actual fact, I have looked over maps, checked uh, archaeological information, and I still am left to wonder, where is the land of Zarahemla? Where is the Valley of Nimrod? Where are the plains of Nephaha? I have been unable to find a record of even one city as mentioned in the Book of Mormon. We turn to the Book of Mormon, we have nothing. There is no Nephite language, there are no Nephite cities. There is not a map in any Book of Mormon. You cannot locate any site. There is no evidence for the book, and yet it's supposed to be a historical record. Dr. Richard Fales, author, lecturer, archaeologist. We have never excavated one single artifact that even remotely relates to this alleged civilization that the Mormons claim existed in the United States, Central America, and in South America. No archaeological evidence has been found to authenticate the vast American empire described in the Book of Mormon. And yet, archaeology has been able to prove the existence of all great civilizations, including those of biblical times. For instance, these coins mentioned in the Bible, the shekel, the dram, the widow's mite, have all been found in abundance. What do we find when we look at the Book of Mormon? In Alma, the 11th chapter, verses 5 through 19, is a listing of the coinage of the period of time that was used by these people. It lists the senine of gold, the sion of gold, the shum of gold. They had lesser coins, the shiblon, the shiblum, the leah. Need it be said at this point that not one of these coins has ever been found. Many people do not understand the Book of Mormon. Uh, this is a history of the uh, people that inhabited the American continent, North, South, and Central America, from about 600 B.C. till about 420 A.D. And we have uh, much evidence, of course, of people having lived uh, there. I am led to believe. Uh, from my research, 
that this is not an actual story, but is a fairy tale, much like Alice in Wonderland. Decades of searching by Mormon archaeologists have failed to uncover one scrap of evidence regarding the people or the places or the events in the Book of Mormon. And Mormon missionaries throughout the world are converting people to the Mormon church by explaining to them that archaeology has proven the Book of Mormon to be true. One of the Mormon church's standard works of scripture is called the Pearl of Great Price. In this is the Book of Abraham that Joseph Smith claimed was translated from some papyrus fragments that he purchased from an e Egyptologist traveling through the area. And by 1842, with no knowledge of the Egyptian language, he translated that into what is called the Book of Abraham. That manuscript disappeared until 1967. It has now resurfaced. Several famous Egyptologists have now looked at it, translated it, and have found that it doesn't have anything to do with the time of Abraham at all. But Joseph Smith did not get right even one word in this whole translation. In fact, he took one little letter that looks like a backwards E and translated it in over, uh, into over 76 words with seven names. Well, there are certain things that are embarrassing to the church. It never ceases to amaze me the number of intelligent people that are in the Mormon church that still accept things that cannot be substantiated. They get so locked in that they're afraid to even take another look. We've run into it many times where they have admitted that rather than sit down and study with us, they'll accept what their church leaders tell them. The Mormon church has a living prophet whose very words can override biblical scriptures or any previous Mormon writing. For example, Prophet Spencer W. Kimball, amidst increasing social pressure, recently had a divine revelation which enabled him to lift the curse off blacks who up until then had been considered by the Mormon church to be low in their habits, inferior in their looks, mischievous, treacherous, and generally deprived of intelligence. Prophet Brigham Young had previously stated that any Mormon marrying a Negro would be killed on the spot and that this sacred law must never change. I read in a Mormon publication uh, an article by the current prophet of the church where he described his power as the president of the church. And in it he was saying that he was basically the liaison between man and God. We believe that the most important prophet to us is the present prophet. So when he speaks as a prophet, we believe that it is as though the Lord were speaking. The finality of the Mormon theology is not based upon evaluation by scriptural evidence, but based entirely upon a burning in the bosom. The Mormon scriptures tell you that that's what you must seek. When the Mormon missionaries come to your home, they'll talk to you about the Book of Mormon, they'll talk about the prophet Joseph Smith, and when they're done, they'll ask you to pray about it and to seek that divine burning in the bosom that they have, and that this will prove to you that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God that the Book of Mormon is really scripture. And so it becomes a subjective evaluation. Scripture is not to be tested. They would encourage us then to read the Book of Mormon. Uh, nothing in the Bible but to read various sections of the Book of Mormon and to pray about it that we might know it was true. When we discuss these things with Mormons, some will say, I don't care if every prophecy of Joseph Smith is proven wrong. I have a burning in my bosom that I know that the church is true. I'll say, have you tested him? I'm not going to test him. I have that burning in my bosom. It's that total and complete trust in anything Mormon. What you are seeing is an authentic first time ever on film reenactment of secret Mormon temple ceremonies that even most Mormons have never seen. And those who have, have sworn never to reveal these secrets under penalty of death. The execution of the penalty is represented by placing the right thumb under the left ear, drawing the thumb quickly across the throat to the right ear, and dropping the hand to the side. All of us who've been through the temple have sworn solemn oaths consenting to having our throat slit and our heart and our vitals throat torn out. The execution of the penalty is represented by drawing the thumb quickly across the body and dropping the hands to the side. In the Mormon temple marriage, the partners are sealed to each other for time and all eternity, 
in mason-like rituals. And without this ceremony, no one can enter the presence of Joseph Smith and become a god. Hey, lay, air. Brother Pratt, having authority, I wash you preparatory to receiving your anointings for and in behalf of John Kimball, who is dead, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Sister Bradford, I wash you preparatory to you receiving your anointings for and in behalf of Eliza Barrett. Eliza Barrett, who is dead, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. I wash your head, that your brain and intellect may become clear and active. Your eyes, that you may see clearly and discern between truth and error. Thousands of occultic ceremonies each day are performed for the dead, so that they too can receive the benefits of Mormonism. Mormons are encouraged to have encounters with the dead, and it's not uncommon for demons impersonating the dead to appear to Mormons stating that they've been converted to the Mormon church in the spirit world and now want their family history traced. Your loins that you may be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth that you may have joy in your posterity. Your vitals and bowels that they may be strong and healthy and perform their proper function. Your breast that it may be the receptacle of pure and virtuous principles. Our living prophet has told us there are three purposes of the church. One is to proclaim the gospel that we've talked about. The other is to perfect the lives of the saints. And the third is to redeem the dead. Consequently, we're actively engaged in doing research work of names and places of birth dates of our families as well as all other mortals that we possibly can. A unique characteristic which sets apart the Mormon church from all other major religions is its fanatical program to evangelize the dead, and because of this, the Mormon church operates the largest genealogical center in the world, complete with a staff of over 600 who sort and catalog incoming census rolls, church registers, wills, and deeds. This information is transferred to microfilm and stored here, 20 miles outside Salt Lake City. I do the research, and then I take their names to the temple and have them baptized and have them sealed in the house of the Lord as family units. When a Mormon goes through the temple to receive his endowments, he's given a pair of this holy Mormon underwear, and he's instructed to wear it at all times. This garment is supposed to be all magical, all protective uh, piece of material that will keep you from harm if you are living the gospel of the Latter-day Saints. But I have to be frank with you, it's probably the most unattractive, uh, dehumanizing piece of material that could be worn. There are no statistics that prove that these temple garments have saved anybody from anything. Although Mormons circulate stories about how these garments, because of their magical power, have saved them from fiery deaths and all kinds of harm and accident or they go to the hospital and deliver babies and they refuse to have them taken off to the point where a doctor has to cut them off in order to deliver a baby. After I'd help my grandmother to bathe and help her out of the tub, we would dry the left leg, put the clean garment on the, the left leg, and then and then only could she take off the garment from the right leg. The garment is supposed to be worn next to your skin and with your other undergarments on top of that as to protect your body. It's really just like wearing a rabbit's foot. It's a superstition. Joseph Smith was heavily involved in the occult. He kept a seer stone that he used uh, as a crystal ball to divine the location of hidden treasures and to translate the golden plates. In 1826, Joseph Smith was arrested and convicted for pretending to find buried treasure with that stone. These special markings in the temple garment make this a special amulet, which is called a talisman. Here in Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible, under the section called Infernal Names, I want to show you something. Here we have the god Mormo, who is king of the ghouls, god of the living dead. And those people that follow him are called Mormons. That's just the kind of conclusion that we can't jump to. It could be a coincidence. Except that Mormons are obsessed with genealogies and temple rites and rituals for the dead, whom they believe can visit the living and who can convert to Mormonism even in the grave. In Chinese, Mormon means gates of hell. 
That's why the Mormon missionaries have problems in Hong Kong, for instance. They have to avoid using the word Mormon in trying to convert the Chinese. Dr. John L. Smith, author and expert on the vast wealth of the Mormon church. The Mormon church is the second largest financial institution west of the Mississippi River. The Mormon church wields economic power more effectively than any other organized religion in the world. They own the $2.6 billion beneficial life insurance company, the Deseret Management and Trust Corporation, hospitals, schools, apartment buildings, farms. They are a major stockholder in the LA Times. They own TV and radio stations, the ZCMI department store chain. They have vast land holdings with ownerships in all 50 American states, throughout Canada and Europe, and on every continent. Two thirds of their properties are tax exempt. Billions of dollars are extracted from church members each year through their mandatory tithing program. It's very difficult to tell what the Mormon church actually owns. Someone has said that even the president of the Mormon church may not know because they might have uh, bought something yesterday or sold something today. Mormons own a substantial portion of Hawaii. They, they are one of the major financial institutions of this area. When you go through the Polynesian Culture Center, they offer you a tour over to their temple. And next to the Salt Lake Temple, the Hawaiian Temple receives the second largest number of visitors. They give you a film presentation of the Mormon Church and have you sign in. And then that name and address is forwarded to a missionary in the area that they're from. And soon after you return home from your visit to the temple in Hawaii, you will receive a knock from the Mormon missionary asking you how you enjoyed your visit to the temple and would you like to know more about the church, using it as an, a way to get in to share with people the doctrine of Mormonism. The Mormons have many other ways of recruiting members through door-to-door -door missionaries, visitor centers, through the thousands of church-sponsored Boy Scout troops and educational institutions, and through the Mormon-controlled Marriott Hotel chain, which places Mormon literature in every room. And for all its talk of building an ideal society, Utah, which is 75% Mormon, leads the nation in bankruptcy and stock fraud, and ranks among the highest in divorce, suicide, child abuse, teenage pregnancy, venereal disease, and bigamy. There are many people in the Mormon church that are having trouble believing it. Many that are in it that don't really believe it at all. My son realized after about five or six months that he had made a mistake in joining the Mormon church. And one of the main things that made him realize that was the ridiculousness of the idea that the Mormons teach that you can become a god. I remember going to, in to talk to the bishop, oh, just shortly before I decided to leave the church. And I asked him, I said, Bishop, where is the love in this church? And I, sa I sat with tears running down my eyes, asking him, we're, I don't feel loved. We hear all of this thing, these things about love and how we're taking care of everybody and, and family home evening and all of these. But where is the love? Why don't I feel loved? And he just sat there looking at me like he didn't have a bit of feeling. Mormonism undercuts the Bible. It undercuts all the other churches so that the Mormon that starts to lose faith in Mormonism will usually feel there's nothing out there to look into. I, in fact, believe that if the Mormon church wasn't true, there was no true church. I had one of those burning testimonies of the Mormon church. When I was growing up, all through the years of, our, of my childhood, my sisters and my brother and I were all best of friends and had a beautiful relationship. Since I've come out of the Mormon church, my sisters and I have had no relationship at all. One of the rules in the Mormon church is that if you want to go to the temple, you can't associate with apostate member, and that's what they call me. After I left the church, things were the same. My friends, a lot of my friends wouldn't talk to me. Now, even though we had been, I had left the church of my own free will, because I knew it was no longer true, you are excommunicated in the Mormon church, and that excommunication is a, a dirty term. With a few rare exceptions, almost all of our Mormon friends just really wanted to have nothing to do with us. I was totally alienated. My boyfriend that I'd had all the year I was at BYU just would have nothing to do with me. He was preparing for his mission, and he wouldn't talk to me. He just said flat out, you know, you're not going to the temple with me, so that's it. 
It was, uh, my friends were told not to have anything to do with me. These two, two kids of ours were on campus at the local college, and they would bring some Mormon kids over to talk to me. And somebody there at the institute told them we had been excommunicated for adultery. And that is the biggest lie there ever was. In Utah, it's very hard for someone to leave the church and make it public. There is, first of all, the threat for your job. You may have a Mormon employer, and this could seriously threaten your work position. Many of the people I see work for the church itself and are afraid of losing their position. Some are afraid of divorce. I know people in high positions that do not believe Mormonism. I've talked to a Mormon bishop that told me he didn't believe Mormonism at all. Recently, a Mormon family that we know, um, even my husband, began asking questions. He called one night and he said, I'm, I know what you're saying now is true. There's no doubt in my mind I can't punch any holes in it. But he said, I'm scared to death that I'm going to lose my wife and my children and my business because when I make this known, what I have discovered, I will lose it all. The motivation for many of them is that Mormonism is a nice place to raise your family. It's the easy road. If you're already here and you're already in it, then why upset things? The biggest danger was that they took me in and I was thinking it was a Christian church. And it wasn't a Christian church. It was a cult. Instead of going back to one of the standard works of the church, I went to the Bible. And I started reading and made up my mind I was going to go from cover to cover. And in the second chapter of Genesis, I, I studied how uh, Eve was convinced by Satan to eat the fruit, that she could become a god. And then in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, uh, Lucifer was cast out of heaven because he too wanted to be equal to or greater than God. I began studying the Bible, became aware of the real Jesus, the real God, and began to understand that the God of Mormonism was not the God of the Bible. We lived the word of wisdom. We attended our meetings. We paid our tithing. We had family home evening. We did all the things we were supposed to do. And when I became a Christian, I suddenly was not the good person I thought I was because God revealed to us our inner pride, the, our inner problems, the things that had not been in focus before because we were so concerned in the outward things. We were so happy with the outward things we were doing that that made us rest thinking we were okay. I was lonely as a child in the church. I was lonely as a married person in the church. I was lonely as a single person in the church. But when I met the Lord, I knew that there was some, someone that would be with me all of the time. I remembered that I should ask Jesus into my heart I remembered hearing my Christian friends say that. So I got down on my knees one day when I was all alone and asked Jesus to come into my heart. I didn't know what I was doing, but when I got up, I had been born again. I found out that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and not an organization. I had been looking all my life for something in the Mormon church, and I couldn't put my finger on what I was looking for. Now, when my mom accepted Christ in her life, she shared it with me. I saw a joy in her life that I had never seen before in all her activity in the Mormon church. And uh, this is what I needed. I feel very grateful to God that our whole family, my wife and myself and seven lovely children, have come out of the Mormon church and know Jesus Christ in a very personal way. Mr. Decker, Mr. Bear, I don't think we can take the case. But there is fraud. Deliberate misrepresentation and the families, the lives that are being destroyed. You don't have the money to fight the Mormon church. They have billions. This thing could go on for years, and they have the resources to do it. You've taken us to Kolob and back, but I don't think we can get a jury to accompany us. Cults are protected under the present legal system and will continue to proliferate at the expense of human lives and families. This is all I have left for my son, Kip. It was the last letter he left me. Dad, I love you more than words can say. If it were possible, I would stay alive for only you. For I really only love you, but it's not possible. I must first love myself, and I do not. The strange feeling of darkness and self-hate overpowers all my defenses. 
I must unfortunately yield to it. This turbulent feeling is only for a few to truly understand. I feel that you do not comprehend the immense feeling of self-hatred I have. This is the only way I feel that I can relieve myself of these feelings now. Carry on with your life and be happy. I love you more than words can say. If you had to leave today, what would you miss the most? Leave from the church. The church? From the church? Mm -hmm. I would rather be dead. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, we'd like to talk to you about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Good afternoon, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The biggest danger was that they took me in, and I was thinking it was a Christian church. And it wasn't a Christian church. It was a cult. Joseph Smith did not get right even one word in this whole translation. The leaders have to go back and rework, rewrite, cover up, change, delete, add, all the way through on uh, all of their books. He can eventually grow into becoming a god himself. Are you saying that the Mormon church pressures individuals into divorcing their spouses when they're not measuring up to the church's standards? And here's a church that teaches family unity, and they destroyed my marriage. In the early 1980s, two revolutionary motion pictures, The Godmakers and The Temple of the Godmakers, were released. For the first time ever on film, the heresies of Mormonism were revealed and the world was exposed to some of the darkest secrets of the Latter-day Saints. These disclosures, showing Mormonism to be distinctly separate from Christianity, caused mayhem within the Mormon Empire. They forced Mormon leadership to modify several so-called unchangeable sacred doctrines to not only counter the message of the films, but to vie again for a place alongside Christianity. While doctrinal changes have been going on since the beginning of the foundation of Mormonism, the changes of the 90s are the most dangerous. We are seeing Mormonism being repackaged with an endearing Christian wrapper. More than ever, the LDS church people are working harder to look more Christian than the Christians. They are spending tens of millions of dollars annually on ad campaigns appealing specifically to the Christian market. Christians must realize that the Mormon hope of appearing Christian is not reflected in their teachings. The recent changes are only cosmetic. Don't be deceived by the pretty new face. For 19 years, I was an active and devout member of what I regarded to be the only true church on earth. I had a burning desire to please God. Much like converts to the Mormon church today, I was attracted by its call to moral decency, its virtuous pro-family values, its politically conservative emphasis, and outspoken enthusiasm for what I believe to be real Christianity. Today, the powerful Mormon church claims a membership of over 8 million people and a determined missionary program steadily converts over 300,000 people annually. Out of the 4.2 million members in the USA, 60 to 80 percent of its converts are said to come from Christian backgrounds. As Mormons strive to be classified as Christians, they obscure their anti-Christian identity and deceive millions worldwide into joining what they promote as another Christian denomination. 
In just over 160 years, the Mormon Church has become one of the world's most powerful financial institutions. Literally billions of dollars a year are received from its faithful members in the forms of tithes. One conservative guess is that $15 million a day is harvested from Mormons worldwide, with over half that from Mormons in America alone. In addition, the Mormon Church generates more than $6 billion yearly through its many business enterprises and subsidiaries. This income places them among the world's wealthiest corporations. The LDS land holdings in central Florida alone outsize Disney World by 10 to 1. Both business and church assets are shrewdly funneled through several holding companies controlled by a corporate power base known as the General Authorities, or the Brethren. Although elevated to the office of spiritual leaders, the majority of these men had been successful businessmen before they were called by revelation to join the LDS hierarchy. Church members, including those in lower levels of leadership, who have faithfully and sacrificially contributed their tithes, time, and energy are powerless to call for an accounting or participate in any corporate decisions. They must faithfully submit to every manipulation from the top. John Heinerman, director of the Anthropological Research Center in Salt Lake City, is an active and devout Mormon who is refreshingly candid about the wealth and power of his church. I have always been fascinated with the great wealth and power that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints wields nationally and internationally. With all the research that we have done, the figure is close to 11 and a half to 12 billion dollars worldwide, all of their investments and holdings. These investments and holdings primarily fall into real estate, which comprise close to half of the assets of the church. Another percentage of about 25% uh, would be in business holdings, agribusiness, their ranches, one thing that I was amazed at was that the LDS church rolls over every year between one and a half and two and a half billion dollars just in its investment portfolio on that. They're into everything from uh, uh, agricultural futures like soybeans, uh, pork bellies. Someone I talked with from the finance department some years ago said, when we make investments, we don't pray to God and we don't go by revelation. We do it just like the world does. It has been reported that the Mormon Church is the second largest financial institution west of the Mississippi River. A few men at the top of the Mormon Empire are uh, tremendously wealthy. They receive uh, uh, income from the institutions that they control. They are among the uh, larger holders of uh, corporate power in our country. Joseph Smith, self-proclaimed prophet of God and founder of the Mormon Church, used the doctrine of divine revelation to legitimize the taking of many wives and spiritualized it as an essential doctrine of his Mormon religion. In addition to his first wife, Emma, Smith appears to have actively enjoyed at least 27 other wives, many of whom were already married. His first plural wife was a barely pubescent teenage relative who was living in their home at the time. Polygamy became a standard requirement of Mormonism necessary for entrance into the highest level of heaven, referred to by Mormons as the celestial kingdom. Brigham Young, successor to Joseph Smith and second prophet of the Mormon church, vigorously proclaimed that the only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Mormon scripture still says that those who abide not in this doctrine shall be damned. In 1890, government pressure forced the Mormon church to reevaluate this divine commandment. The confusion and anger that resulted from this undermining of a non-revocable eternal commandment resulted in the formation of many offshoots of Mormonism. Generally known as fundamentalists, these groups openly practice polygamy today and hold to the teachings of the first two prophets. Changing doctrines is not new to Mormonism and has over the years fragmented Smith's original church into over 100 separate groups that still claim Joseph Smith as the prophet of God and the Book of Mormon as divine scripture. Well, I was born and raised in the Mormon church and I can remember uh, because of my heritage going to my cousin's family reunion and we had to wear name tags with um, the wife's name so we could 
so we knew which family we were descended from. We were raised with the basic tenets of Mormonism, including polygamy. That is what was openly and freely practiced uh, in our community. My great-grandfather, John D. Lee, was a polygamist. He served under Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He had 19 wives and 64 children so that he could become a god as God is now. He really believed that God and Jesus are polygamists and that every Mormon man would have to have a lot of wives. My father had a total of 11 wives. We were very sincere about all the aspects of Mormonism. Uh, we used the Book of Mormon as one of our main sources of uh, knowledge. Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants when the Mormon scriptures say that you must have plurality of wives. It is a requirement in Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It is clearly stated that uh, if we are to attain the highest degree of glory that we uh, must do the works of Abraham. Therefore, we were taught that in order to attain the celestial glory, uh, a man must take more than one wife. There's also the warning that any person who will not believe this and enter into polygamous temple marriages, they shall be destroyed. So the pressure was on always for men to uh, marry several women. It, it's been estimated there, there's between 25 and 30,000 polygamists in the state of Utah. I was in the Mormon church for 11 years, never missed my tithing once. I had a temple recommend. And then the Lord showed me how that they had departed from the original track that Joseph and Brigham had set it out on. They passed a law that a man could only have one wife. And actually, uh, it's, the, it's the order of heaven for a man to have more than one wife. Those who take their religion most seriously uh, return to polygamy because it has not uh, been uh, expunged from Mormon scripture. In fact, if a Mormon is very honest, he uh, probably needs to be polygamous. Are you involved in fertile marriage now? Yeah. There were problems. <laughs> Jealousy being the primary problem. Uh, the man reigns supreme in polygamy. We're trying to educate to people on how to get the father back in his place in the home. And when that happens, then the the woman will follow and uh, more wives can be added. My father constantly claimed revelation for every last thing that we did and controlled everything that we did as much as he could. And um, I came to find out what, what a perverted thing he was really involved in. He would actually take uh, several of his wives to bed at once. And he was very involved in uh, marrying other men's wives. Plugamy is a horror. The history of polygamy is a history of women who shared their men. And uh, it's a history of power and manipulation. The youngest girls uh, were reserved exclusively for the older men that would have a harder time securing more wives. So that's how they worked it. And my father, um, he, he got most of his wives by bribing other men with his daughters. <laughs> I was one of the ones that refused to fall into that, and I chose my own husband and uh, married and had a very loving relationship for 15 years and, uh, until I lost him through this blood atonement process. Blood atonement teaches that there are some sins that God cannot forgive by the works of Calvary. And therefore, the sinner must have his own blood spilled. This blasphemous doctrine not only diminishes the power and the purpose of Christ's blood, but glorifies the atoning power of the blood of the Mormon sinner. While steadfastly observed by Mormon fundamentalists, this anti-Christian principle originated with Joseph Smith and was furthered by later Mormon prophets. This troublesome doctrine of blood atonement blemishes the wholesome public image required by Mormonism's leaders. Today, the brethren in Salt Lake City still grapple over the predicament they find themselves in when having to both affirm and deny blood atonement. For example, the late Mormon apostle Bruce R. McConkie, in his book Mormon Doctrine, denied that the church ever practiced or taught blood atonement. 
yet on the same page stated that because the blood of Christ is not sufficient to forgive certain sins, the Mormon God requires man to have his own blood spilled. On the 27th of June, we were carrying on our life as usual and um, happened to be the 144th anniversary of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. My half-brothers came into our office and murdered my husband. At the same time, there were three other consecutive deaths uh, going on. My brother-in-law, Duane, and his eight-year-old daughter, Jenny, was with him, and they also killed her. Our names were on the list of uh, to be atoned for. Uh, my father uh, believed that we were traitors to God's cause and that our blood must be shed to atone for the sin of uh, turning against light and knowledge, as he supposed. Blood atonement is if you have charity enough uh, for uh, someone to save them, uh, the shedding of their blood is the only way that they can atone for certain sins. People really thought they were doing a favor in my great-grandfather's day to shed the blood, save their soul, and it's still taking place today. My great-grandfather, John D. Lee, was one of the Mormon men who were called avenging angels or destroying angels. It was their duty, their obligation, to cut the throats, shed the blood of people who were apostate Mormons, who were, who were guilty of speaking against uh, the authorities. Jesus shed his blood that, uh, as an infinite sacrifice, but there are some sins that the blood of Jesus cannot atone for, and there it therefore it requires the shedding of uh, that man's blood to atone. For adultery, for apostasy, for marriage to a Negro, for not receiving the gospel, for lying, for any of the other offenses, they'd have to have their own bloodshed to have forgiveness of sin. To put it simply, my father's beliefs stem directly from Mormonism. Not one, not one thing is different than what the Mormon, early Mormon doctrine is. The original doctrine that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught is exactly what I believe. I'm now at present baptizing people, and I have five apostles now, and we're out uh, teaching and, and preaching the gospel trying to get the Mormons into the original uh, doctrine that Brigham and Joseph had it set on. And I refuse to give it up. I've been cast out of the Mormon church because of it. That's the reason why today people are still killing each other, shedding the blood so they can have forgiveness of sin. And it comes directly from Joseph Smith and from Brigham Young. There's been 27 murders since uh, 1972, my uncle, my sister, my brother Arthur, my brother committed suicide, which I, is a direct consequence of all of this. I would just like uh, you to know that uh, if anything happens to me ever or to my children, I will uh, personally, uh, I believe the Mormon Church in general will be responsible because the very doctrine of blood atonement stems from Mormonism. Many Mormons are persuaded that their beliefs are in unity with biblical doctrine, but the reality is that the Bible is not their rod of truth, for their leaders deny its authority and hold their own writings and statements in higher esteem. While they claim that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth, it has undergone numerous revisions and changes since its original edition over 160 years ago. In fact, one researcher counted over 4,000 changes. The first mark of a cult that is always and ever true is extra biblical revelation. They pay lip service to the Bible. They say, yes, that's a fine book, but God spoke to us last night or a hundred years ago, and we have a new revelation that supersedes the Bible. Watch out for this and flee it like the plague. The Bible says if any man add one word to the book of this revelation, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If a man take away from the book of this revelation, God will take away from him his name out of the book of life. It is a very serious thing to tamper with scripture. Near the end of his life, Joseph Smith insisted, there is no error in the revelations which I have taught. Yet to date, Mormon leaders have altered, dismissed, and covered up thousands of historical and archeological errors, false prophecies, 
and doctrinal contradictions. Subsequent Mormon leaders have affirmed that once a prophet speaks, the thinking has been done. End of controversy. God works in no other way. Yet the prophet Ezra Taft Benson stated emphatically that any current Mormon prophet can override the pronouncements of any previous prophet. Mormon scholars today call this progressive revelation. Another mark of a cult can be called presumptuous messianic leadership. When you see a leader that declares himself to be something special, more than man, that is when you must beware. The truth of Christianity holds that the individual is a priest before God. There's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And anyone who inserts, insinuates himself between you and God and says, I will be your leader, that person is in violation of the truth of Scripture. The Bible claims God and His Word to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. It has withstood the test of time and skeptics and remains historically and archaeologically accurate. Christians are therefore confident that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and cannot acknowledge the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ. Paul continually warned the early Christians not to be deceived by anyone bringing another gospel of Jesus Christ. As a Mormon, I was taught that God the Father was a resurrected human. He'd been born a human baby, died and was resurrected. And then in heaven, he kept having sex with his supposed spirit wives. And among the many, many spirit children were Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ. Mormonism says that God is a man. He has the same male parts, the same passion as any man has. His wives are bearing his spirit children. These little spirit children by the millions are still waiting for their opportunity to come to this earth, receive a body, join the Mormon church, and then they could go back to heaven and become gods and goddess themselves. I was taught the reason that, that babies cry when they're being born is because they are raised to full-grown maturity in heaven. So when that spirit body comes into the baby's body at birth, that body has to be compressed. That big, big body has to be compressed into the little baby body, and that's what makes the baby cry. This book and other books I have also gives proof that there won't be any females in hell. They'll supposedly all be given to the few Mormon men who become gods. Mormon men are promised unlimited eternal sex. The poor Mormon woman is promised eternal pregnancy. Mormon men need to understand that there's a threat that if they're not good Mormons, married in the Mormon temple and faithful to the end, then when they get to heaven, they will be castrated. They'll be made eunuchs. There'll be an operation take place. So Mormonism takes the beautiful word of God and makes it into a sexual story. I'm standing here in beautiful Jerusalem this impressive structure is built on the sacred side of Mount Scopus by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as an extension to Brigham Young University. I believe that it's very important for the Jewish people to know about the deception and misrepresentation that was employed in building this Mormon edifice. Mormons use political intrigue and, and great sums of money in order to cover up their true intent to proselytize Jews and convert them to Mormonism. Most of the religious Jews of Jerusalem consider this Mormon structure an abomination and sacrilege of holy ground and are outraged by its presence. These clothes that I'm wearing are the authentic Mormon temple attire which Mormons believe are copied from the actual attire that the priesthood wore in the Temple of Solomon that stood on this site behind me. Mormons believe that there's been an apostasy in Judaism and that they hold the only true authority to administer in the rituals of the temple that will be performed here in Jerusalem. Mormons believe that they are the only true Jews on earth today, that they come from the tribe of Ephraim, and that they have the true blood of Israel. Mormon males 
are ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood and believe that when they're baptized, their blood actually changes from Gentile blood to the, the blood of Israel. Mormons believe that they will build the New Jerusalem near Independence, Missouri, and it will be the primary capital of the kingdom of God on the earth, and in Jerusalem will be the secondary capital, which will be administered by Jews. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints came here to Jerusalem under the banner of Christianity to establish this edifice and to establish their presence here when they're no more true Christians than they are true Jews. Mormon Apostle Bruce R. McConkie taught, there is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There are two kinds of salvation in Mormonism. The first is general salvation, which comes through the death of Jesus Christ and guarantees resurrection for all mankind. The second is personal salvation. Each person is judged for his degree of righteousness and works, and depending on those, will be placed in one of three kingdoms. But the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. How are we saved? On what basis do we go to heaven? When you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins on Calvary's cross, and that sacrifice is the sufficient payment for your sins, you are instantly and eternally saved by the grace of God. Former Mormon prophet Lorenzo Snow summed up the Mormon doctrine of salvation by stating, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. This is supported in Mormon scripture. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. Yet Jesus himself clearly taught that God is spirit, that he did not have a body of flesh and blood or flesh and bone. In spite of such clear instruction, Mormon prophet David O. McKay declared that the appearing of the Father in bodily form to Joseph Smith is the foundation of the church. Someone who says, I saw the Father, is dealing presumptuously, short-circuiting good Christian theology. It is the Son who alone reveals the Father. This is no small matter and is the plumb line of Mormon heresy. Mormons believe that God is a resurrected man and that we can become just like him. A God cannot be made. A God cannot be created. The definition of the eternal God is that he is eternal, immortal, invisible. That's who the God of the universe is, and there is none other. A man is a created being, and as a created being, it will always be the case with him that in God he lives and moves and has his being. He is dependent upon the fountainhead of life, which is God himself. He cannot move by his own volition or anybody else's to the level of godhood, although that is very appealing to certain individuals. There's a question before the house in Christianity in our time that really is, can a man become God? That question is answered in the affirmative by many of the cults, like the Mormons, like the New Age movement. I assure you, it is totally presumptuous. I, as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, am somewhat active in what is called the New Age movement. The New Age movement consisting of uh, things like uh, crystal gazing, channeling, pyramid power, and so forth and so on. People of the New Age movement are often more open to the truths of Mormonism, like the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith working with the Urim and Thummim, than conservative Christian folks who are mostly closed-minded to these things. The goal of every Mormon man is to become the duplicate of the Mormon's concept of God, to reign over planets and solar systems, and enjoy everlasting celestial sex with thousands of goddess wives. The Mormon temple plays a vital role in the achievement of such goals, yet 75% of the LDS members are not deemed worthy enough to enter and will never see the inside of a temple. However, when members do meet church temple requirements, then they are allowed to participate in the LDS occult temple ceremonies, which actually bring them under further spiritual bondage. Part of this bondage is the requirement to wear sacred temple underwear 24 hours a day from that day on. Behind me 
is the Los Angeles Temple of the Mormon Church. And inside are many devout Mormons who are fulfilling what they consider to be godly, noble obligations to their faith and to their God. What they don't realize, though, is that the rituals and the ceremonies that they are involved in are straight out of the occult. How do I know that? Because I was a Mormon who went to the temple. I attended the temple many times, but more importantly, I was also a high priest of Satan. Before I joined the Mormon church, I had 12 years of experience in witchcraft and Satanism. And when I went to the temple, I was astounded at the high level of similarity. The handshakes and the grips involved, the, the secret tokens of the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood are in fact right out of witchcraft and Satanism. The concept of, of putting on as part of your priesthood robes an apron which God rejected in the Garden of Eden. Lucifer himself in the temple says, this apron is a symbol of my power and priesthoods. So when I went through the temple, I was ultimately very satisfied by it because I thought this was, in fact, a profound satanic initiation ceremony. All throughout the temple grounds here in Salt Lake City, you will find all sorts of occult symbols, symbols that are generally associated with witchcraft and Satanism. They are predominantly on the temple, but they're also on such buildings as the uh, assembly hall, and you can even find them in the visitor's center. I mean, the, the place is virtually a Disneyland of occult symbols, and yet there's absolutely no Christian symbol anywhere in here. These doors behind me are doors in the east end of the Salt Lake Temple, and overarching the doors is a trapezoid keystone with an inverted pentagram, which has been used for centuries as a symbol of devil worship, as a symbol of Satan. In fact, the main function of the pentagram in its inverted form is to call down the kingdom of Satan and the manifestation on earth. The Bible forbids participation in divination, witchcraft, and contacting the dead. Among the Mormon temple rituals is the practice of baptism for the dead. When their dead are called up to convert to Mormonism. During these ceremonies, many Mormons have had exhilarating and even frightening encounters with apparitions or spirit beings inside the temple. Former Mormon prophet Wilfred Woodruff admitted to being surrounded by the dead at one point while inside the temple and warned that the dead will seek out others who entered the temple. Joseph Smith was a sorcerer and practiced crystal ball gazing or fortune telling and was convicted of this practice by the New York courts. Smith's practices of magic and necromancy led him annually during a witchcraft holy day to the Hill Camorra in New York specifically to seek encounters with a spirit being called Moroni. During this time he would attempt to conjure up the spirit from the dead. There is strong evidence that in 1824 Joseph Smith actually had to dig up the body of his dead brother Alvin and bring part of that body with him to the Hill Camorra in order to gain access to the gold plates on which were written the Book of Mormon. It was also known within his community that Joseph Smith used blood sacrifices in his magic rituals to find hidden treasure. C.R. Stafford writes, Joe Smith the prophet told my uncle William Stafford he wanted a fat black sheep. He said he wanted to cut its throat and make it walk in a circle three times around. After his death, Smith was found to be carrying a magic talisman on his person, sacred to Jupiter, designed to bring him wealth, power, and success in seducing women. While Mormons call themselves Christians, they do not regard the prohibitions of God seriously or have respect for the Christian Bible, which they claim abounds in errors and mistranslation. This conclusion leads the Mormons to place Joseph Smith above God and beyond criticism. His biblically forbidden practices are devoutly and enthusiastically emulated by Temple Mormons. While the general public may not see similarities in the religions of Mormonism and Satanism, remember that that is exactly what the Mormon brethren wish to hide. While Mormons claim to be Christian, many of their basic theologies are identical to Satanism. For years, we at Saints Alive have warned of the Luciferian roots of Mormonism and the Satanic worship within its ranks. Now at last, the LDS Church has officially acknowledged that we were right. Recently, a secret internal report surfaced from Mormon Bishop Glenn Pace, a member of the presiding bishopric of the LDS Church. 
It alleged that widespread satanic ritual abuse across America, Mexico, and elsewhere was being perpetrated by both members and leaders of the Mormon Church, bishops, temple workers, and even tabernacle choir members. Acts of sexual or physical torture and murder were done in a religious or occult context and subjected children to molestation by parents and other adults. At least 45 of the scores of LDS victims Pace interviewed for his report claimed they were forced to observe or participate in human sacrifice. Obviously, there are some who would like to lay the blame on infiltrators or individual preferences. But the broader issue is that Joseph Smith was deeply involved in the occult. It is therefore quite natural to surmise that Smith's followers would be involved in the same practices that he advocated. Mormon parents don't realize the spiritual danger they are putting their children in by simply attending this temple themselves. The danger to a Mormon is, is that when you go and you stand at the veil and you say, power in the priesthood be upon me and upon my posterity throughout all generations of time and all eternity, you are putting the curse of Satan's priesthood upon yourself and upon your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. We are seeing in Utah the fruit of this in social statistics. We are seeing that homosexuality is running rampant among people in Utah. We are seeing child abuse. We are seeing teenage suicide. Homosexuality has increased by 50 percent, 100 percent, 200 percent, and it has just gone upward. Also adultery, the number one reason that the church excommunicates is for adultery, and its numbers are staggering and increasing every year. Another area of concern is the rising amount of child abuse within the LDS church. The kind of impression Mormons want to be associated with is the epitome of all that is wholesome. Yet the happy family facade in Mormon-filled Utah is disintegrating rapidly according to recent national statistics. In a state monopolized by a religious group that advertises marital harmony, Utah's divorce rate is higher than the national average. 55,000 women are abused annually by their partners. Child abuse and neglect has increased 212% in the last decade, with over 10,000 new cases last year alone. Rape and sexual assault for adults has increased 93% during the same period. There has been a staggering 379% increase in child sexual abuse to children under 14. Much of the abuse is incestuous and Sadly, the perpetrators are given lenient sentences because of an oddity in Utah law which accommodates sexual abuse by a Mormon relative. In 1987, Bill Clawton, a lifelong Mormon, began investigations into allegations of immoral practices among the Mormon leaders, specifically President Gordon B. Hinckley. Gordon Hinckley was involved in heterosexual and homosexual love affairs at the home on Lakeline Drive, as well as the apartment above the car lot on South Main. I was personally involved with the Apostle Gordon Hinckley sexually. We became financially involved in a house at 2213 Lakeline Drive. We bought the house for a party pad. <clears throat> And Gordon Hinckley came up there all the time, and I had to arrange women for him. I had to arrange booze for him. I had four or five bedrooms, three-story job, beautiful home. We used to go up there all the time. I took prostitutes up on the, uh, up in Indian Hills, which is an exclusive neighborhood in Salt Lake, and this went on for several years, and basically. Most of the girls they requested me to bring to them were black girls. And most of them were tall and kind of linky. Louie would bring up four or five girls at a time, bring them to the door. Mr. Hinckley, amongst other people, were there. But they'd drink and dance. And maybe the girls would dance for them, you know, in front of them. Uh, and then they'd gather up a man and go into the bedroom. Mr. Hinckley and, and all of them were sitting there, and I remember one night when I was there, he was sitting there, and he was really getting loose, you know, and he had his arm around this one girl, and, and pretty soon I seen everybody just taking off, going this way and that way to different rooms. 
these parties are something else. And these people that are supposed to be good LDS. They were supposed to be important people and supposed to be uh, good church going people and things like that. Some of them were bishops and counselors and various things that, uh, that I actually seen going there or leaving there. There was a couple of young boys at a party one night when I was there. And I'd say they were around 15 or 16 that uh, I seen them talking with Hinckley and they went off to a bedroom together. Hinckley and the boys, the two boys. He liked to have feminine looking boys. Youngsters. I'm talking about 15, 16 years old. Just little youngsters, babies. They live a double standard. Their, their leaders are saying one thing and living another lifestyle. They excommunicate bisexuals in the mainline LDS church. Why aren't the leaders getting away with it? He had used me sexually, myself personally, and then excommunicated me on the homosexuality. We just believe that if Gordon B. Hinckley is professing that you should be morally clean so you can sit in judgment upon others, that he should be judged by the same standards he's trying to use. When you see it with your own eyes, you know what they really do, especially high officials like Mr. Hinckley. I says, I can't believe this. Had similar allegations been made against a Christian leader or rabbi, it would have received worldwide publicity. But in this case, an extraordinary media blackout stopped the hottest story of the 80s concerning one of the top Mormons in the world. Tonight I'm being excommunicated here at the Oak Hills First Ward for telling a story of truth about one of the high-ranking members of the LDS Church, uh, namely Gordon B. Hinckley. There is nothing within the doctrinal uh, procedures of the church that allows any one member the opportunity to bring an accusation against any of the presidency of the church. My good bishop here at the Oak Hills First Ward, uh, as I got to know him, uh, he's a good man. Uh, he knows the truthfulness of the story. He has talked to one of the witnesses personally. And unfortunately, working for the church and being a bishop in this ward, he is unable to stand up for me. As any image conscious corporation, the Mormon Church responds to public relations problems smoothly and quickly. It commands an efficient and polished communications team to market Mormonism to the world. Key Mormons have been placed in powerful positions that have had the ability to control virtually all media programming. The radio station that dared to air an interview with Charles Van Dam was subsequently bought out within days and the talk host who featured the story was fired. The Mormon controlled media conglomerate Bonneville International Corporation is one of the largest owners of radio and TV stations, bringing in more than a half a billion dollars in revenue each year. The power of the LDS church and media was confirmed during a 60 Minutes news expose on Mormonism. After labeling the story as sloppy journalism, the Mormons forced a rare apology from 60 Minutes and the dismissal of the producer of the segment. Mormons in political office have been able to pressure Hollywood not to produce films that portray Mormonism in a negative way. Recently, a $20 million miniseries based on the book The Mormon Murders was kept off the air because it would have revealed the conspiratorial power of the Mormon church in the Hoffman murder case. I'm especially concerned with the uh, amount of influence they have over the media. You know, the people who really uh, control our country are, are those in control of the media. The Mormon Church owns not only a number of radio and television stations in not only in Salt Lake City, but in uh, Idaho, in Washington State, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, in Kansas City. And, and not only do they own a number of these radio stations and cable companies, but companies that they also own in turn own others of these. When the church wants to get uh, airtime in Brazil or somewhere else, they, all they need to do is to go and ask the government people, we would like to uh, present a half hour program on the family and, and, and on increasing patriotism, and right away they'll get airtime. Two years ago, Hungarian television came over and did a nice story on the Mormons, and over 400 million people learned about the Mormons. Church didn't have to pay for it, and the ironic thing is that these big television evangelistic ministries, they have to pay out millions of dollars. The Mormon church has it down to a science, and they are probably the best PR people of any religion that I know.
The Mormon Empire's immense economic power not only aids Mormon control in the media, but in politics also, where they look to the day when they will have total command, world political takeover, and the reinstatement of the free practice of polygamy and blood atonement are just some of the bizarre hopes of the Mormons' end times empire known as the Kingdom of God. The fanatical goal of world supremacy is openly denied but secretly plotted by the elite inner LDS leadership, the Brethren. The church has been fortunate to have a number of its people in prominent positions around the country in political authority, senators, congressmen, people in the CIA and the FBI, and at times the church has called upon them to go and do a favor for the church, get the church out of a jam, or use their political clout in behalf of the church. The head of church security who recently died was a top FBI man under J. Edgar Hoover. They have retired CIA men working. They have uh, people from the Navy counterintelligence. And so the church has amassed an incredible amount of security personnel that gives it some of the best security of any religion on the face of the earth. Someone I talked with said, we can get anything we want on anyone we want at any time we want. Apostle Bruce R. McConkie said, through this church and kingdom, a framework has been built through which the full government of God will eventually operate. They believe that they must establish a worldwide Mormon kingdom on earth in order for Christ to return and rule on earth. Recently, a massive effort has been underwritten to mount an all-out recruiting drive with the deliberate intention of marketing Mormonism as a bastion of domestic strength and middle-class respectability. In addition to the 44,000 full-time missionaries in the field, Mormon advertising saturates the pages of many best-selling publications, including TV Guide and Reader's Digest. In response, hundreds of thousands of free Mormon videos and their Holy Scripture, the Book of Mormon, are requested annually. The Mormon Church shrewdly purchased airtime following one Billy Graham TV special and promoted the Mormon 800 number, hoping to capture undiscerning audience inquiries. They are spending tens of millions of dollars annually on ad campaigns appealing specifically to the Christian market. They are joining Christian organizations and targeting Bible studies, Christian home school groups, and churches, particularly focusing in on local pastors with friendship programs. Christians must realize that the Mormon hope of appearing Christian is not reflected in their teachings. Mormons still believe that all Christian pastors are part of the great horror of all the earth. They still have the hope of becoming gods and goddesses. The Mormon Jesus is still the brother of Lucifer. They still teach that our holy God was once a man and has a body that Jesus was begotten through a sexual relationship between the Father and Mary, that the Garden of Eden was in Missouri, that the Bible is missing many plain and precious parts, that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth, that plural marriage is a holy principle. They still follow the teachings of a false prophet. They still usurp the holy priesthood of Christ. They still baptize for the dead. They still wear occult underwear with Masonic markings. They still believe they must offer up secret handshakes and secret names to enter into God's presence. They still teach that all the Christian creeds are an abomination in God's sight and more. God's word is still reliable and it doesn't vacillate and Mormonism is still in direct violation of the word of God. One cannot revise Mormonism enough. One has to repent of it. The ones that murdered my husband and my family I forgive them entirely. I love them. They're my own family. And they truly, sincerely feel like they're doing what's right. And I'm praying that somehow through all of this that I get the opportunity to witness to them and to show them uh, how the Lord has worked in my life. And uh, because, but for the grace of God, I could still be involved in that too. My faith in God is something that is unshakable and uh, through all this tragedy that's one thing I have gained is an abiding love for the truth.